It's organized by our PhD reps, and we've put together a very special PhD showcase, um, which is going to consist of six different presentations, which encompass um, a wide range of research within the department um, and showing what our PhD students have been up to in the past year or past two or three years, depending upon where they are in their PhD journey. Um, so they're going to run one after the other and in sequence. And if you have a question about a particular presentation, please put it in the chat box and we will answer questions um, for all of the presenters at the end of the session. Um, and in addition to that, we would invite you to join the presenters after the session um, in the virtual wine and cheese, which will take place on Wonder. Um, so with that, I will ask Kemi to share her screen and we will get started. Hi everyone, my name is Abdir Rahim and I'm a final year PhD student in the Rollins lab. In our lab, we work on several exciting biophotonics projects, ranging from microscopy, holography, all the way to microfluidics and optical ultrasound imaging. But today we're going to talk about structured illumination microscopy, or SIM. We're going to explore the speed limits of this technique and see whether we can see both small and fast. Let's first start with some background. As you might know, conventional microscopes can only image down to a finite resolution that we call the diffraction limit, and this is around 200 nanometers. Any features smaller than this size will appear as blurry. As the name suggests, this limit results from the diffraction of light. As you can see on figure B, the image of a point by an optical system is not a point, but what we call an airy pattern. Therefore, if two light sources are too close one to each other, the airy patterns will overlap, as you can see on figure C, and we will not be able to resolve them. The diffraction limit has long been thought to be an unbreakable physical limit. It was only a few decades ago that new super resolution methods were discovered, which are capable of overcoming the diffraction limits and for which the 2014 Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded. SIM is one of these techniques and can image at twice the resolution of conventional microscope. You can see on the figure below, on the left you have the image of a white field microscope, and on the right the resolution is much much better with SIM. Let me explain how SIM works. As you might know, in traditional fluorescence microscopy, we illuminate the sample, which is the image on the left, with uniform light, and then we collect the emitted fluorescence, which is the image on the right. Because of the diffraction limits that we mentioned earlier, we lose high resolution information in the process. On this example, the stripes on the scarf of the lady that we could see on the left picture, which is the sample, are no longer visible on the image given by the microscope on the right picture. With SIM, this is a little different story. Instead of projecting uniform light onto the sample, we illuminate it with stripe lights that we shift and rotate at different angles, as you can see in the middle picture. And this allows us to extract high resolution information from the sample that we could not have access to with traditional microscopy. As you can see on the left picture, we cannot see the lines on the scarf of the lady, but then we can reconstruct these lines on the right picture with a super resolved image. It still sounds mysterious, right? To try and explain it a little better, let us take the example of that chair. Most of us must have seen these chairs in the department. You must have also noticed that strange patterns appear on them. Did you ever wonder where they come from? Well, if we zoom in a little bit, we can see that the chair is actually made of two meshes superposed to each other. And these strange patterns appear at the places where those meshes are not exactly aligned. This is what we call the moiré effect. Long story short, when you superimpose two high frequency patterns on top of each other, you're going to see a resulting image that contains lower frequency. And this is exactly how SIM works. By projecting stripe light at high frequency, we can see higher frequency information from the sample that we will not have seen otherwise. As we said earlier, in 2D SIM, we illuminate the sample with stripes that we shift and rotate three times. And this gives us nine raw images that you can see on the left. Then we feed these nine images into a reconstruction algorithm, which will generate a super resolved image that you see on the right. I don't have time to go into more details on how the reconstruction is done, but as you can understand, since we need nine images to reconstruct one single super resolution image in SIM, 
the temporal resolution of SIM is going to be worse than that of conventional microscopy in which we only need to acquire one image per time point. But we recently learned about an image reconstruction method called rolling SIM, which claims to improve the temporal resolution of traditional SIM by a factor of nine by reusing the same data sets but in a different way. Let me explain. In traditional SIM, we use the first row images 1 to 9 to reconstruct the first SR image, and then row images 10 to 18 for the second SR image. But with rolling SIM, the second SR image is reconstructed with images 2 to 11, the third one with images 3 to 12, and so on and so forth. This made us wonder what the true speed limits of SIM are for a given set of row images. So we decided to investigate those, and in order to do so, we developed a method to assess the capacity of SIM to track fast changes in both low and high resolution information. For that, we eliminated the sample with a sine wave at different temporal periods t over time. We then wanted to determine the smallest of these temporal periods for which the super resolved information in the reconstructed SIM image could not track the elimination profile of this sine wave. We then extended our analysis to more temporal periods. We used the normalized root mean squared error, or RMSE, as a metric to measure how similar the magnitude of each spatial frequency in the sample is compared to the original modulation profile. If the RMSE is low, then we can say that temporal period is well resolved. I realize all that may sound like nonsense, so here's a simpler version. The vertical axis that you see shows the size of the features in the sample with the smallest ones at the top. The horizontal axis shows how fast the illumination is turned on and off, with the slowest, easiest to track modulations on the right. Yellow values are bad and blue ones are good. The white dotted line shows the resolution limit of a normal microscope, and the black one shows the one of a SIM microscope. Since the values above the white line are less blue than those below the white line, we can conclude that the reconstruction is worse for super resolved features, which is what we expected. We also see that the reconstruction of super resolved features is worse when the illumination is modulated faster, which makes sense. But we were surprised to see that this is already the case at periods of 40 to 50 frames, way before we get to the 9 frame interval of normal SIM that we expected. Therefore, the rolling SIM idea cannot possibly work. The reconstructions will be poor no matter which approach you use, so why might as well stick to normal SIM in this case? Thanks to our method, we concluded that SIM cannot super-resolve phenomena that occur faster than the time needed to acquire 40 to 50 frames. But most importantly, the speed of SIM cannot be increased by reusing the same dataset of raw images like it is done with the rolling SIM method. Thank you for your attention. Now, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. Our work investigated Ingram dynamics and systems consolidation, and we found that coordinated communication in the hippocampus thalamus cortex circuit was essential for this process. We started with experimental data from Tony Gavis group that showed that recent recall relies on hippocampus because hippocampal Ingram cells can be activated by partial cues at a recent time point, whereas the ones in medial prefrontal cortex cannot. However, at a remote time point, recall now relies on medial prefrontal cortex because prefrontal cortex Ingram cells can now be activated by partial cues, whereas the ones in hippocampus can no longer be activated. This process of going from silent Ingram cells to uh, active Ingram cells in medial prefrontal cortex was termed maturation, and the opposite process of going from active Ingram cells to silent Ingram cells in hippocampus was named dematuration. And they also showed experimentally that the maturation of cortical engrams was dependent on the output of hippocampal engram cells during consolidation. We then asked ourselves the question, what were the mechanisms behind the engram cell dynamics observed in experiments? To answer this question, we started with a computational model that consists of a spiking network with hippocampus and cortex being connected via direct monosynaptic projections, as in panel A and we saw that this configuration cannot reproduce the Ingram dynamics observed in experiments. So, in panel B, we uh, subjected this network to a simulation protocol that consists of a training phase where the network learns a series of patterns, a consolidation period where the network evolves spontaneously, and then finally a testing phase where we measure the ability of the network to recall the memory from partial cues. 
Then at the end of the training phase in panel C, we see that we have a very strong synaptic coupling from hippocampus to cortex. However, in panel D, we will see that in the testing phase, the recall curve for cortex is not consistent with the experiments. We have a very high recall F immediately after training, then a sharp decrease and then a slow increase. And then in panel E, we block the Ingram cells in hippocampus during the consolidation phase to probe their role in the maturation of cortical engrams. And then in panel F, we will see that now we have a very flat recall curve for cortex, which is also not consistent with what is observed in the experiments. To solve this problem, we added a new region to the network, the thalamus, in panel A, and now we have a hippocampus thalamus cortex circuit. And we found that hippocampal engram cells, as well as the thalamic engram cells, are now essential for the maturation of cortical engrams. So in panel B, we subjected the network in panel A to a similar simulation protocol consisting of training, consolidation, and testing. And then in panel C, we see that now we have maturation of cortical engram cells Dematuration of hippocampal engram cells, and our model now also predicts a flat recall curve for thalamic engram cells. And these engram dynamics are associated with coupled reactivations of engram cells in the consolidation phase, as we can see also in panel C. Now, if we block engram cells in hippocampus or block engram cells in thalamus during the consolidation period, we disrupt the coupled reactivations of engrams during the consolidation phase, and as a result, we prevent the maturation of cortical engram cells. And therefore, we found that the subcortical engram cells are essential for the maturation of cortical engrams. We observe a very similar effect when we block inhibitory neurons in each region of the network, and therefore we concluded that inhibitory input to hippocampus, thalamus, and cortex is also essential for the maturation of cortical engrams. So in panel A, we block inhibitory neurons in hippocampus, in panel B, we block inhibitory neurons in cortex, and in panel C, we block inhibitory neurons in thalamus. And in each case, we disrupted the coupled reactivation of engrams across the circuit hippocampus, thalamus, and cortex, and as a result, we prevented the maturation of cortical engrams. In conclusion, our model was able to reproduce key experimental findings, specifically the engram cell dynamics in hippocampus and cortex, as well as their inner dependencies, and we also reproduced the crucial role of coupled oscillations in the hippocampus, thalamus, cortex circuit. Our model also yielded several testable predictions regarding hippocampal engram cells, thalamic engram cells, inhibitory engram cells, and the role of thalamocortical synaptic coupling in the dynamics of cortical engrams. Thank you very much for your attention, and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you would like to discuss our work further. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this bioengineering seminar. I am Martina Genta, and I'm a PhD student in Riley Green's group. And today I'm going to discuss about uh, tailoring biosynthetic hydrogel systems for living bionic devices. So first of all, what do we mean by bionic devices? Bionic devices are medical devices that are used to record or stimulate electroactive tissues when you need to restore uh, lost functions or alleviate the symptoms of a disease like, for example, Parkinson or Alzheimer. And here on the picture, you can see some examples ranging from cochlear implants, deep brain stimulation, retinal implants, and so on and so forth. So conventionally, these uh, medical devices are made of uh, metallic materials, like, for example, platinum, gold, or platinum iridium alloys. And uh, these materials are characterized by um, high stiffnesses, as you can see on the graph on the right hand side. Uh, and in particular, they are characterized by uh, young modulus ranging in, um, in a range of hundreds of gigapascal. Uh, and this leads to a, a poor biointegration uh, when you implant this material within the human body uh, because there is a mechanical mismatch between uh, the high stiffnesses of the metals and low stiffnesses, as you can see in the graph, in the range of kilopascal of uh, human tissue and in particular of the brain tissue. And uh, overall, this uh, leads to the formation of a glial scar that is a, a scar um, that is uh, surrounding the implants and will uh, lead to a decrease of the long-term properties of the device and a decrease of the uh, signal-to-noise ratio. 
So over uh, the last decades, uh, scientists have tried to solve these problems in, in various different ways, like, for example, coating um, these um, uh, these, these devices with uh, polymeric or uh, hydrogel coatings uh, that um, allow to decrease uh, the young modulus uh, and therefore decrease this mechanical mismatch, or to integrate, for example, biomolecules like growth factors or adhesion cues as coating of these um, devices. However, also in this case, um, the effect of these biomolecules is normally uh, short and therefore uh, the performances are always uh, limited. So most recently, um, there is a new concept that is called living bioelectronics, where the aim is to um, encapsulate uh, and have directly uh, cells uh, within these uh, medical devices. So uh, during my PhD, I'm working on uh, this new electrode uh, design aiming at incorporating living components inside the neural implant. And in particular, the main aims are to reduce the formation of the scar tissue, improve the integration with natty tissue, and therefore um, improve and uh, have a formation of natural synaptic connection between the device and the host tissue. And in particular, um, the part I'm working on is, to, um, is the development of a biosynthetic hydrogel system that is able to promote and support the development of a 3D uh, neural network. And as you can see here on the schematic, um, the device will be um, will consist of three layers, an electrode, a conductive hydrogel to increase the conductivity, uh, the conductivity properties, and then a biosynthetic hydrogels where the cells, in particular neurons and astrocytes, will be encapsulated. So the first step of the PhD was the choice of the material. And since uh, we wanted to have um, tailorable mechanical and chemical properties, I decided to have a, a synthetic material and in particular PVA, polyvinyl alcohol. I modified this uh, polymer with norbornene groups, the one in, in light blue. And then thanks to DTT, that is a cross-linker, and thanks to visible light, uh, I was able to create PVA norbonin hydrogels. And in particular, this system, as you can see, has uh, both cross-linked norbonin groups, but also free and available norbonin groups that can be used later on for a specific um, topography modification of the hydrogels. So the first thing I tried was to uh, encapsulate uh, primary ven ventral mesencephalic cells uh, that are cells that are able to um, differentiate in neurons and astrocytes, so uh, neurons in uh, red and astrocytes in green. But as you can see here from the confocal images, cells were not um, able to uh, develop and to spread inside the polymer network. And this was because there were some missing cues, and in particular, adhesion cues, but also a space within the hydrogel network where cells could develop. So the next step was to modify the PVA norbonin um, hydrogels. And what we know from, um, from, from the brain is that astrocytes and neurons secrete some enzymes that are called matrix metalloproteinases, MMP, and in particular MMP2, uh, that is used to modify and to um, rearrange the extracellular matrix. And therefore, um, I decided to uh, add into my polymer network uh, the gelatin. And this was because gelatin not only has some um, adhesion cues within the polymer, um, the, 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 the polymeric uh, matrix, so it has some RGD uh, cues, but it also can be degraded by MMP by the cells uh, themselves. So what I tested, it will, I tested different ratio of uh, PVA and gelatin, so ranging from pure PVA uh, hydrogel network uh, until, uh, and then um, half and half, so half PVA and then half gelatin, and then a higher amount of gelatin. And as you can see here from the confocal images, these are uh, primary astrocytes. The primary astrocytes were able to um, develop and spread within the hydrogel network uh, when the gelatin um, was uh, the, the, the main component of the hydrogel network. 
And if we take a closer uh, view on the cells, here in, in yellow you can see paxilin, so the formation of focal adhesion, and you can start seeing uh, the beginning of uh, focal adhesion formation um, indicated by white arrows. And then you can see that also the MMP2 enzyme um, here in red is expressed in the cytoplasm and not in the nuclei of the cells, and this indicates that the cells are motile within the hydrogen network. So overall, uh, synthetic, pure synthetic PVA norbornin hydrogels did not, did not allow primary cells connection, but the introduction uh, of gelatin within the hydrogel supported primary astrocytes development and adhesion. And therefore, uh, the next steps are the encapsulation of a mixed cell population uh, of astrocytes and neurons and testing the functionality of, of these neuron networks using uh, calcium imaging. So I would like to thank everyone involved in this project and uh, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any question. Hello everyone, my name is Milia Hasbani and I'm a PhD student at the Department of Bioengineering under the supervision of Professor Dario Farina. Today I'll be presenting my research which is titled Integrating Computer Vision with Neural Interfacing for Semi-Autonomous Control of Robotic Limbs. The human hand is a dexterous tool which we use to perform multiple tasks, one of which is grasping. Now there are actually 33 different grasp types and deciding on which grasp type to use comes naturally to most of us. We instinctively assess multiple factors using sensory information such as our vision. However, my electric prosthesis users have another step to go through. They have to press a button or co-contract, which is tensing up their forearm muscles, to cycle between different grasp types to choose from. This is because it is very difficult to understand and choose the grasp type just from the EMG. This way of controlling a prosthetic is cumbersome and not very intuitive, which is exactly what we wish to address in this research. To develop a more intuitive system for grasping objects, we propose to integrate computer vision to simulate visual sensory information and complement the information extracted from EMG. The idea of combining an autonomous system with the user control of the prosthetic has been previously explored in a handful of papers. However, there are some limitations we wish to address. We really aim to focus on the user experience and intuitive grasping. So any sensors should be integrated within the prosthetic so there are no external devices. The EMG should not just be used as a threshold to decide when to take a picture or open and close the hand. Instead, the EMG should be used for continuous control of the wrist function, regardless of the use of the fingers. At the same time, the intention to close the hand should come naturally and intuitively from the EMG. Our grasp detection models are also different and they generalize to novel objects and different object approaches. This means we are proposing a shared control strategy with the following specifications. The system should be dexterous and able to function in a real-time setting. Importantly, it should be user control centric and intuitive, such that the user feels that they are in control of the prosthetic as much as possible. We also aim to switch between four different grasp types while controlling two degrees of freedom of the wrist. This will be implemented using high density surface electromyography for wrist control and to provide the command to activate the grasping, along with a computer vision system to detect the grasp type. Altogether, this is not possible with current prosthetics. Here's how the system would come together. The control should come from the user's intentions the majority of the time through EMG which will provide control for the wrist and the intention to close the hand or open it. The computer vision system should be responsible only for selecting the grasp type, and this will be applied when the user gives the instruction to close the hand. So there will be EMG electrodes inside the socket of the prosthetic, and there will also be a potential number of cameras integrated with the prosthetic, which are continuously receiving visual input. Both of these are passing information on to the processor, which is controlling the prosthetic. The first part of my research focuses on extracting meaningful information from EMG by using motion capture to label the EMG with the kinematics of the hand and wrist. We then use this to create and train regression and classification models so we can predict the wrist angles from features of the EMG and also classify the hand function into opening, closing or neutral. During the study, we record EMG and motion capture of the subjects at the same time while they perform a series of movements of the hand and wrist. 
These include simple one degree of freedom as well as combined degree of freedom movements of the wrist and hand, including four different grasp types. We then extract the root mean square and further spatial features from EMG, and from the motion capture, we calculate the angles of the wrists and fingers. From this study, we can see that we are able to predict the angles for the wrist from the RMS feature of the EMG. And overall, we get an R2 score of greater than 0.8 and a root mean square error of less than 0.15. We also present the confusion matrix from when we are classifying the movement of the hand is either opening, closing or neutral. Though the classification does not seem too high, the results refer to hand opening and closing when classified on top of wrist movements and in different positions of the wrist, in which case these results are promising and could be further improved with the integration of the computer vision system. The second part of my research focuses on the computer vision system, where the aim is to identify the grass type based on an external input for an unlimited set of objects. We do this through developing a computer vision algorithm with hardware embedded on the wrist. We focus on four different grasp types. So out of the grasp types available from prosthetics and based on anatomical and practical uses of humans, we choose to focus on the four grasp types shown here, which forms the basis for our classification algorithm. This algorithm consists of several steps. An image is pre-processed and then passed through a convolutional neural network to create a level set mask which provides features for an unsupervised k-means clustering algorithm to detect the grass type. This was trained on images from the Jacquard dataset to provide the results in the confusion matrix, where we can see that we classify 88% of grass types. This result is on single images, while in the dynamic case, you would have multiple images before deciding, which in principle would boost the confidence in the accuracy. The next challenge was to convert the system from a static to a dynamic system, which is continuously receiving images and updating the grasp type detected. The flowchart indicates the general process, which we have described before, but in addition, we are adding these extra steps to reach a real-time system. The main challenge to focus on here is the processing time, which needs to be sustainable in a real-time system. So to conclude briefly, our aim was to create a more intuitive prosthetic control by adding an external system to help detect the grasp type. To do this, we have a regression algorithm to predict the risk kinematics from the EMG and a classification system to detect whether the user intends to close or open the hand. This integrates with the computer vision system for which we have developed an algorithm to detect the grasp type, but we still need further work to refine the real-time system as well as further work bringing the two systems together. I would like to thank the EPSRC for funding my research and I would also like to thank several members of the Neuromechanics and Rehabilitation Technology Group for their support. Of course, I'd also like to thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer at the end of the session. Hi, my name is Freddie and I'm a third year PhD student here at Imperial. My research is on insect biomechanics. In particular, I study the physical constraints of feeding in leafcutter ants. As you might not be familiar with leaf cut ants, I will show you a short video demonstrating their leaf cutting behavior. Here we go. Here you can see a forger ant cutting a leaf fragment by repeatedly driving her mandibles through the plant tissue. This might look trivial to you, but for an ant of only a few milligrams in body weight, producing forces large enough to fracture leaf tissue is actually quite an extraordinary feat. In fact, leafcutter ants are exceptionally good in cutting. They form massive colonies, which harvest up to several thousand square meters of leaf area per year. This leads to serious deforestation and crop damage. So it's not surprising then that they are considered the prime pest species in South and Middle America. So, what makes them so successful in cutting? In order to approach this question, I want to present three distinct chapters of my PhD. One condition for cutting is to produce sufficiently large bite forces, which I hence measured in chapter one. Second, I looked at the head morphology, quantifying the different components contributing to these bite forces. And third, I investigate cutting ability. The ability of an individual ant to cut a given substrate not only depends on the available bite force, 
but also the required force for the mandible to fracture the tissue. So these mandibular cutting forces need to be measured too. Let's start off with the bite forces. To measure bite forces, I build a measurement rig consisting of a capacitive force sensor connected to a lever system. Individual ends were placed in front of the lever tips and they then quite aggressively bit onto the sensor, resulting in force time curves, an example of which you can see here on the right. This measurement rig was also equipped with a motor controlled slider, allowing me to change the distance between the lever tips. Increasing this distance effectively increased the opening state of the mandible, so allowing me to measure bite forces as a function of mandibular opening. I don't want to dive into the results too much here, but I want you to pay attention to one specific aspect, which is the amount of force that they can produce. This individual achieved a maximum bite force of around 200 millinewtons. The strongest individuals of a colony, however, produced forces up to 1,000 millinewtons, which is the equivalent of the weight of an apple. This might not sound like too much, but for such small organisms, it is astonishingly high. So to understand how they produce such large forces, I looked at their head morphology. Here, you can see the internal anatomy of an ant head segmented from micro CT images. The majority of the head is filled by the mandible closer muscle, consisting of up to thousands of individual muscle fibers, all inserting to a centralized tendon that pulls the mandible. To identify the number of muscle fibers, their length and orientation, I developed a tracking algorithm, the reconstructed results of which are shown here in blue. With this tool at hand, I used um, a simple mechanical model to predict bite forces from the in and out lever length of the mandible and the muscle force, which in turn is a function of the arrangement and size of the muscle. I want to point out a key difference between organisms with an endoskeleton like us and the ones with an exoskeleton like our leaf cutter ants. So when we want to be strong and produce large forces, we can train our muscles and thereby increase the size of them without any clear spatial constraint. So in theory, we can grow them excessively large. If you have an exoskeleton, however, you by definition can only fill the space inside. And this is quite a crucial limitation. Because to, to produce large the largest possible forces and work for a given head volume, the arrangement of the muscle needs to be favorable and close to a theoretical optima. Such theoretical optima can be calculated from simple geometric models, like you can see here on the right. And again, I don't want to go into too much detail, but leaf cutter ends seem to operate very close to such an optimum producing high forces while maintaining um, a large opening range of their mandibles. So let's go back to the chapters. We've quantified the bite forces and their muscular determinants, but we still need to measure one remaining factor, which is the cutting forces. I started measuring cutting forces using a fiber optic sensor that measures the forces indirectly through the deflection of a bending beam. At the free end of this beam, a polymer film is mounted, on top of which an end head is placed in a fixed position. With motor stages, the beam and sensor are then moved against the stationary mandible, causing the mandible to cut through the polymer. On the right, you can see an example force time curve showing the maximum force at cut initiation and a more or less steady state phase after that. The upper curve shows the forces of a fresh razor blade, razor blade that has never been used before. And uh, you see that the forces are much larger compared to the mandible. I 
cannot yet conclude too much from these measurements, but one thing seems clear. These mandibles are extremely sharp cutting tools. Okay, so let's briefly summarize. Leafcutter ants produce excessively large bite forces that are enabled by closer muscles with a near optimum arrangement. These muscles drive extremely sharp mandibles, allowing leafcutter ants to cut even very tough plant materials. I uh, want to conclude this presentation by promoting our group a little bit. So um, there is much other interesting research being done in, in our group, not only in leafcutter ants, but also other insects. And if you're interested, you can check out the website or the Twitter. Um, and yeah, if there are questions to my talk, I think there is a Q&A session in a bit, so don't hesitate to ask. Thanks. Hello, I'm Enrico. I work in the Sensory Neuroengineering Lab, where I study the interaction of audio and visual components of speech. So let's talk about audiovisual hearing aids. I'll start with an introduction on the challenges limiting traditional hearing aid adoption, the role of visual cues in speech comprehension, and how this project is inspired by this latter principle. The first motive for this study is the fact that, while 10% of the UK population live with hearing impairment, hearing aids have surprisingly low adoption statistics. Despite a steady increase in the last 10 years, as this data from large UK surveys suggest, still less than half of those with hearing impairments own hearing aids. This is also despite the NHS providing the devices, the fitting, and the screening for free. Actually, the free primary care must be working. The UK is amongst the countries with the highest adoption rate. The second motive is that speech and noise is understandably hard to understand for those with hearing difficulties. Speech and noise is a complex issue. In noise environments, the spectrotemporal properties of speech are degraded, making speech perception a difficult task. We often refer to this as a cocktail party scenario in the field. Speech and noise issues are related to the degradation of the middle and inner ear, as well as issues with the neural pathways of sound and speech perception upstream. We refer to the latter as auditory processing disorder, a hearing condition often diagnosed in those with degraded auditory processing pathways, but healthy peripheral hearing. The third ingredient is that the natural audiovisual speech improves the speech reception threshold. Sambi showed this as early as 1954. It's quite intuitive. We've all noticed the effect of degraded visual information during the pandemic, as people wearing face masks are harder to understand. The interesting thing is that speech perception is enhanced by visual components more pronouncedly in the hearing impaired, as Pushman et al. showed recently. So how does the brain inform audio processing with visual stimuli? Converging evidence supports the idea that ongoing microscopic neural oscillations reflect neural coding of stimuli. This rhythmic cycling is thought to be related to the states of high and low excitability in the local areas. This phenomenon has been widely credited to support numerous cortical functions, including speech parsing, as reviewed by the recently departed Peter Lakatos as early as 2006. In the figure on the right, you can see how that might work. If the stimuli is periodic, phase locking it into the high excitability state increases the response. So here we show an example of how the mouth opening event occurs just before the acoustic signal increases in amplitude. This visual event can be thought of as a signal that resets the phase of neural stations in the auditory cortex to prime it for the upcoming auditory event. So there we are, done with the background. I'll now summarize the work done on this project. Let's start with the aims. First thing to clarify is we don't build hardware nor clinically or commercially viable software. First, we must understand what types of visual signals best improve speech and noise perception in which populations, and we do so both behaviorally and in terms of neural pathways. So we ran some behavioral tests on humans. We employed the audiovisual grid corpus made of sentences of the type place green at P5 please or set red at G8 again to measure comprehension in background noise by asking participants to repeat what they had heard while reducing the quality of the audio with background noise. For those interested, we ran the test at the 50% comprehension threshold, which for this corpus is at minus 9 dB signal to noise ratio. Along the x-axis, you can see the various types of visual stimuli. The rightmost is the natural video as seen by a camera facing the speaker. The next along, towards the left, is the same type of image but reconstructed by an artificial intelligence software that takes the audio and a still image as inputs. The next along is a result of running edge detection on the first, and the fourth one is a cartoon constructed from the first. The first two are simpler signals, namely circles that appear to grow and shrink on screen in time with the audio. 
The y-axis shows comprehension increase with respect to control condition with a black screen. As you might or might not expect, natural images perform best, with the fake image performing surprisingly well still. It is apparent, looking from right to left, that the more information is removed from the visual stimuli, the less the resulting video helps in understanding speech. Simpler is not better in this case. We find that texture is key. Also note that the first repeat of the experiment, the circle condition distracted more than it helped. We also used electroencephalography to image the brain while participants performed a similar task, but with longer audio segments, stories rather than short sentences, for technical reasons. So let's have a look at what the analysis of the EEG data looks like. To simplify, you might think of the x-axis as time with respect to the onset of any given syllable. So the syllable starts at time zero, and the brain responds to the syllable in the following few hundred milliseconds. The colorful squiggles then represent the brain response to the average syllable. For the interested audience member, this is actually a continuous transform, derived by reconstructing the instantaneous audio envelope from a range of time lags from the EEG data. As you can see, and surprisingly if you consider the behavioral results, the circle is the condition that generates the largest and earliest neural response. The same conclusion is even more apparent when considering a condition where the audio was turned off and participants lip-read a silent video. Our results agree with similar studies. Much like O'Sullivan et al., we see that the brain can derive a representation of the auditory stimuli from visual components of speech. Further analysis will allow us to understand why texture-rich visual stimuli result in better speech and noise comprehension improvements, despite eliciting lower entrainment. Another aspect which is work in progress is a computational model that simulates the behavioral exercise that our human volunteers performed. The hope is to be able to use such a model to find an empirical value for the amount of information that is present in each of the video types. Another way to think about this is, does the implicit training we have in lip reading from faces, rather than simplified visual signals, hinder our ability to perform as well as we might otherwise with the latter? This work isn't an end in itself. The biggest issue with implementing audiovisual hearing aids at the moment is that you'd need to carry a big GPU on your Google Glass-like hardware in order for the models proposed by Eskimes and others to be able to produce helpful and realistic-looking speaking faces from noisy speech. There are real-life clinical and commercial applications that would benefit from better understanding of what features of audiovisual speech drive the increase in comprehension and why, in order to design computationally inexpensive but still useful audio-driven visual features. Okay, so after that um, wonderful set of talks, we are going to open the floor to questions for our speakers. Um, so just to recap, we had six talks. Um, the first talk was Abdi telling us about structured illumination microscopy. The second one was Douglas telling us about um, system consolidation for memory. Then we had Martina talking about hydrogels for implantable um, neural networks, and then Milia talking us about uh, neural interfacing for um, control of robotic limbs. And then we had Freddie telling us about leaf cutter ants. And finally, we had Enrico, who was talking to us about audiovisual hearing aids. So we've had a very wide selection of talks, and I think we do have some questions um, within the chat. So um, starting with a question for Martina. So Martina, the question comes from Victor Kang. Thank you, Victor. Um, and the question was, what do you mean by adhesion cues in gelatin? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So what I meant is uh, gelatin is derived from collagen and collagen is made up of uh, amino acids. And in particular in the gelatin, there's a sequence of amino acids that is RGD, uh, arg um, arginine, uh, glycine, and aspartate. And this is the sequence that cells recognize for adhesion. So actually the cells can adhere to this sequence specifically um, in, uh, that is present in the gelatin. Great, thanks. Um, we actually, we have another question for you, so maybe we'll ask this at the same time. And this question comes from Andre. Um, so Andre says, if such a living bioelectronics electrode is inserted in the brain, it will record signals from the neurons growing in the electrode and together with astrocytes covering it, not from neurons in the brain. Is that right? And if so, why is it useful? And then he apologizes. 
Yeah, that's no, that's that's a fair question. Uh, actually, what I didn't mention in the talk is that the um, hydrogel is designed to degrade, so it will not stay there forever. It's just helping the initial part when there's the acute inflammation, and then it's designed to degrade so that the high, the device will be directly in contact with cells and the brain itself, and no more what we insert inserted. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I answered your question, Andre. Yeah, thanks. Wonderful. Um, OK, so next we have a question from Fabian. I don't know if Fabian wants to appear on screen. Um, but the question says, let the computer vision approach to decide on which grasp type to employ, Ilya. Um, are you planning on refining the system online with feedback from the patient? Thanks for your question, Fabian. Um, so. It's something that we might consider in the future. Oh, hi. So, so there are systems which use similar computer vision algorithm um, for the grasp type, and they have they use like the Google Glass, and the camera is mounted on the Google Glass, and they use um, like augmented reality to sort of help the user with live feedback, and then the user can give feedback through the EMG. So, we didn't want to take this approach because we don't want to. And to add any additional accessories to the prosthetic. And also because we want to use the EMG for control of the wrist and not just for grasping. Um, but you know, there's a lot of research in my group about different types of feedback with prosthetics, and it's definitely something we might consider integrating with my project. Um, but on a different side of things, we can think about adaptive learning for the models that we use um, for the control. Um, and that is something that we might consider definitely. Sounds very interesting. Thank you very much uh, for for elaborating a bit on that. Um, I I love the the idea that you take these these huge data sets out there and kind of relabel them for things that you can you know grasp in in certain orientations. I think it's a uh, it's a very clever approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your feedback. Yulia, I actually have a question for you as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the processing time that's required at the moment for your algorithm and whether that well, how that influences the practicality of this approach? Yes, yeah, so because there's multiple parts, each part has its own processing time. Um, the processing time for the EMG control at the moment is only around like 62 milliseconds, which is pretty normal and pretty standard. And um, it shouldn't affect how the user uh, feels that. Um, at the moment, the computer vision system is something I'm literally working on at the moment. Um, it's still pretty slow for real time, uh, but with some more computational processing, it will pick up speed very much. So I'm aiming uh, to bring that down to within like 50 microseconds to 100 microseconds. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. So just to encourage people, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I think the chat is open for everybody to post questions now. So. Um, Next, we have a question that is for Freddie, but because Freddie is unfortunately um, traveling at the minute, um, David Labont, his supervisor, is going to field said question, I think. Um, so the question comes from Naomi, and the question is, if you were to design a super functional knife inspired by the leafcutter ant, what does it look like? And what kind of movement should you make with your arm in order to achieve the best cut? Hmm. Yeah, so first uh, I can, I uh, apologize for Freddie. He is stuck on a train that is delayed. I'm sure he would love to be here and answer the question instead of me, and he would do a much better job than me. So I also apologize that you have to make do with me instead. But I will try now only to answer your question. So I think the key problem is that there isn't really a good knife for any situation because it very much depends on the actual material that you want to cut. So to give you one example, if you think of a cheese knife, it has holes in it, or some cheese knives have holes in it, mostly because friction becomes a huge problem because you have a relatively sticky material. If you think of a bread knife, it has serrations because you have a fibrous material that you want to cut that is quite squishy, so you need some grip onto the material and rip the fibers apart. And if you think of, like, say, a paring knife for some meat or for some vegetables, it is mostly just very sharp because neither friction nor something like fibers matter all too much. So there's not really one knife that fits all scenarios. Depending on the scenario, you want to design a certain knife. Now, what is the scenario that these end knives are particularly good at? They seem to cut largely relatively thin sheets. And here what becomes really important is that you avoid that that sheet bends out of the way. So 
if you take a thin sheet and you apply a force, then normally this happens. So you somehow have to prevent this from happening. And indeed here, then something like some small shear force, so the movement of your arm might help, but we're still trying to get some data on what the ants actually do when they cut freely and unrestrained and um, by tracking the motion of the heads and their mandibles to understand better whether there is some special movement that you can do to help that scenario. So, OK, thanks, David. Um, the reason, so what you're saying, it really makes sense, right? Different knife is good for different purpose. I ask this because that mender of that, you know, ants, that I don't know, is that mouse? Is that, yeah, that, the appendage, it looks more like steak knife than vegetable knife. <laughs> that, that's why, like, you know, that, that, is that the best sort of a shape for their function? Or well, actually, if you are to cut those thin sheet, which is like lettuce, you know, maybe maybe they are different design that could work too, but, but yeah, that, that was why I was wondering. <laughs> no, it's a fair question. Uh, mandibles, indeed modified appendages and ants are not just there for cutting, they do all sorts of things with it. So it might be that there's a compromise between different functions that have to be met. I see, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so uh, we have a question in the chat uh, for Enrico. Um, Enrico, this question also comes from Andre. Um, and the question is why or how is visual texture important for audio processing? Uh, thanks, Andre. Uh, so, with uh, we ran a few pilots as well as the results that I presented here today uh, that show that degrading the visual features, so the video that our participants are looking at, uh, has a, a disproportionate effect uh, very early on. So, as soon as you remove any uh, texture information, you get a, a big decrease in participants' ability to understand speech with the aid of that visual feature. So, for example, we applied edge detection algorithms, uh, we applied uh, grayscaling algorithms, uh, we messed with the colors in other ways, and all of these had a, a big effect on comprehension, which is something you wouldn't quite expect. Um, my hunch is that there's a lot of uh, human training involved, um, and that retraining on different stimuli might bring humans back to a comprehension that is uh, similar to that of uh, of when humans see natural images. So I, I guess that's my my interim answer before we conduct any more experiments to find out um, if training uh, and and humans humans ability to understand speech with a uh, with degraded visual stimuli are related. I see. Th thank you. So basically, the reason why I I ask this question is, um, and that's just an intuition, but but you know, visual stimuli have different cues embedded in them, uh, which are processed depending on the type of cue at different levels of the visual hierarchy. If we're thinking about the ventral stream, for example, so for yep. example, texture is processed later or at later stages than contours, for example, right? So by by constructing visual cues and pairing them with with audio, one might be able to determine where this fusion happens, right? If it's only a high level cue that helps, then well, it doesn't happen in V1, for example. Yeah, yeah, this is this is the direction we're heading in with uh, EEG studies. Uh, the data is recorded and the analysis hasn't been done yet. Um, so that that's the that's exactly the the direction we're going in, and hopefully we'll be able to give a good answer to this in the next few months. I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Um, OK, so we have another question in the chat from Ilya. So the question is, would you be able to explain how the GRASP classification system works? Um, how are the different types of GRASP determined? Yeah, so I, I briefly mentioned that because I didn't want to get too technical. I wasn't sure who the audience would be. Um, but yeah, I can go over that again. So basically, we capture a picture and we do some basic image pre-processing on that, you know, cropping, um, getting into the center of the picture. And we pass that through a CNN. And this CNN has been trained to create a level set mask of the image. So what it does, it basically segments the pictures in the image into different categories. And um, it's sort of forms different boundaries and layers within the object. And from that, we can extract further features, which we use in an unsupervised k-means clustering algorithm. 
which literally just splits them into um, we've got four graph types, so four groups um, based on you know, so basically the level set mask features allow us to extract information about like the shape of the object and the ratio of the object. Um, so so that's using the k-means, which just splits into the different graph types. Um, so we don't do like object recognition, and then based on the object, we have a grass type um, because that doesn't necessarily generalize to unknown objects, whereas unsupervised k-means does. And it means that depending on how we approach the object, we might choose a different grass type. Uh, for example, if you approach a bottle from the top, you might use a tripod grass for the cap of the bottle. But then if you approach from the side, because we're looking more at the shape of the object, you would use a general grass. I hope that answers the question. Great, and there's one other question for you about EMG signals. So are the EMG signals strictly picked up from the lower arm or could you pick them up from the biceps and how would this affect the visual aspect of the system? Yeah, so in my project, I have been looking at the muscles of the forearm and that's because these are the muscles that mainly control the wrists and also um, partly control the fingers. There are other prosthetics that you might be able to partially control using other muscles. Um, some of them also use like muscles of the shoulder. Um, but yeah, it, it's just, it would lead to a different type of control. Um, the visual aspect of the system is sort of separate, so it wouldn't affect it in that way. But I do use that specific EMG control to decide when the user wants to close their hand. And so I doubt we'd be able to do that using any other muscles because you need the muscles of the forearm. Uh, you'd get better results with the muscles of the wrist, of course, the muscles placed around the wrist. Um, but you, you know, when we're talking about prosthetic users, these muscles might not be available for everyone. Wonderful. Um, Abdi, we have a question for you in the chat. Um, would the uh, sim work faster if you knew that your image is sparse um, by using compressed sensing? Uh, hi, Andre. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, can you uh, explain what you mean by compressed sensing? Yeah, so you know the, the Nyquist sampling criterion, right? So if you have a dense data array, well, you have to sample at twice uh, the highest frequency. But if you knew that your data vector is sparse, meaning it's mostly composed of zeros. Like for example, if we're taking all of the participants in this in this seminar, then uh, only very few people would have their cell phones turned on. So it's mostly zeros and only a few ones. So that's an example of a sparse data set. And th there are theorems in math that show that actually the Nyquist criterion does not apply to compressed uh, to sparse data array. So you do not have to sample them uh, densely if you're guaranteed that it's a sample, it's a sparse data set. So you can subsample it, therefore you can go faster. Well, I have no idea if that would be the case. Um, the only thing with the SIM is that we need to acquire like uh, images of the whole sample. Like my understanding of well, the way you describe like, the sparse sensing, is it like when you uh, do some zero padding or things? No, 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 no. Or no, no, it, it's an intrinsic property of your of your data. Um, you know, if, like if you look at the, I don't know, the, the sky at night, yeah. you will see some stars, but mostly it's black. So that's a, a sparse data set that you might want to sample with super resolution. Uh, so when you talk about um, uh, like sparse, uh, are you talking like having a, a sample which is sparse? Sparse? Yeah. OK. Um, with very few uh, objects in it. Um, that's a good question. I think it's it's going to, the resolution is, is going to be better, but uh, we're not going to overcome the speed limits of SIM in this case. In our case, the sample that we use was like a random set of beads. I mean, we simulated beads, which are already kind of sparse. Uh, the problem is it comes from the, uh, I mean, the rolling SIM method that we uh, I described uh, does provide a faster speed, but this only is the case for low resolution information. Uh, when you have like a high resolution feature, the problem is like that the speed uh, needed to reconstruct this high spatial frequency feature uh, cannot be increased by having just a sparse uh, sample. That's my my understanding of it. Okay, thank you. But thank you for your question. Okay, I think we have one last question before we head over to the virtual wine and cheese. And this question comes to us from Maria. Um, it's for Enrico. 
Um, so Maria asked, you mentioned that the dots were confusing to the participants instead of being helpful. Uh, could you hypothesize how text such as subtitles added to videos would affect the audio processing of the participants? It's a very uh, pertinent question for this year. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, very interesting. Subtitles, um, subtitles uh, are are processed in a different way than the visual cues uh, that that come from the anatomical movements that produce speech. Um, in the sense that they they're they're, they haven't evolved with human perception of speech in the same way that visual cues from lip movements have. They're, they're, they're an add-on. Uh, there's something we learn um, that, that comes from our invention of language and text, right? So, so it, it's really dependent on the speed at, speed at which people can read and is a lot less linked with um, um, a nearly hard-coded, if we, we want to talk pseudoscientifically, um, um, ability to, to to improve your speech comprehension um, by 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 resetting what what many believe to be the neural oscillations that under underpin your comprehension of speech with which your brain processes speech, uh, resetting the phase such that they're more sensitive to the speech. Uh, and, and this is the way that we think of visual cues and and text is something completely different. It's your brain doing two things at the same time and trying to juggle the two, uh, and can only do them so fast. So it really depends on the speed of the speech and um, your ability to nearly multitask. OK, thank you. Um, all right, so with that, I'm going to wrap up this section of the session. Um, I'm going to thank very much the speakers for preparing these really interesting talks and for exhibiting such a wide array of uh, research in the Department of Bioengineering. Um, thank you to the PhD reps for um, putting this together and to Naomi and Kemi um, for making sure it went off without a hitch. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Naomi. Thank you very much, Angela, for doing such a great job sharing the session. Um, uh, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for the great talk and the Q&A session. Um, this is the last seminar of the year, and with that, um, I did. So I, I was the, um, I am the academic uh, organizer for the seminar series this year. Uh, with the role, I would like to thank all the speakers and the hosts of this seminar series for the entire year. There are so many great talks, and. Um, the hosting was phenomenal as well. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, the, the almost all the seminars have been compiled by a wonderful uh, seminar uh, uh, enabler, <laughs> the uh, uh, communica communication and event manager, uh, Kemi. Uh, she compiled all, all the recording in one YouTube channel, which I just posted in the chat. Please check that page. Uh, if you want to uh, find recording of the past uh, events, as well as this one is going to be uploaded fairly soon, I think. Uh, Kemi, if you are there, would you come on <laughs> from the video? Because you really made this entire series so seemingly smooth and accessible and so well organized. Please, everyone, join, join, join me to thank Kemi. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kemi. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Naomi, because you have been a great help with these, especially when I was off. So thank you so much. So uh, with that, I would like to say, uh, let's meet in the, in the other sort of virtual uh, BioNG lounge, if you will. Uh, please uh, go there to meet the speakers of today. And also maybe meet each other and then say, you know, sort of just uh, mingle a little bit at the end of this very, very long special year that we had. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Um, see you in wonder, I guess. <laughs> thank you, everyone.